and hello to everyone. Um, just to, again, reiterate some of the things that have already been said, deinstitutionalization is a process. Um, and it takes time, and it's in stages. And um, your first slide you'll see really talks about what our goal is. Our goal is that people end up in the community as independent um, as they possibly can with the supports that they need. But what I'm going to be sharing are some of the things, the process, the roadmap that YI has taken. That it wasn't just as smooth where it went, you know, people went from the institutions into the community, but rather that they're, they're there are different stages along the way and how we continue to listen and how we've learned how to listen better. And as we have learned to listen better, we have been putting things in place that's supporting people to live the kind of lives that they want to live in the community. So as we know, advocacy is very important and we have been talking about advocacy today. Um, we know grassroots for the SDGs was very important. Advocacy is extremely important in the community. We need to prepare the community to support people with disabilities. There's still a lot of myths, there's still a lot of stigmas in the community, and as was recently said, we don't want to then dump people in the community. We want to ensure that when they're in the community, they're living effective lives in the community. So one of the things that we've been doing is being a part of community boards. Before we think of someone entering the communities, and educating the community about people with disabilities. It's speaking to um, local civil servants. We're teaching, finding opportunities to teach the police force about how to interact with people with intellectual disabilities. Teaching emergency workers in the hospitals how to interact with people with disabilities. Talking to employers, finding opportunities where people can go in to volunteer and then paid internships and then possible employment because you know, when we, when we look for employment opportunities, then there's that fear that people with disabilities can't, right? Because what they're seeing is, are the disabilities and not the abilities. So getting out and educating the community is advocacy that continues and that is very important and that we, we absolutely try to ensure that we're still doing. What is very important is the involvement of government. Government, and we've, we've heard it before, that we've talked about funding. Some of the reasons that we can do what we're doing is because of funding, funding from a federal government, from the state level, from the city level, ensuring that there are grants and there are opportunities out there for um, funding when it's, it's not provided in one place, we can find it in other places. So funding is key. And for deinstitutionalization to happen, that funding needs to be there to provide the supports in the community, to train the staff of how to understand people with disabilities, how to ask the questions, because you won't get an answer that you don't that you don't ask for, right? Saying what you want, if they don't know what it is that they want, then they can't tell you what they want because we go from the level of our experience. So opening up, teaching staff how to open opportunities to people so they can make not just choices, but informed choices. Partnerships are very important. So here you see government, NGOs, DPOs, business, entrepreneurs, because it takes it. You know, the saying is it takes a village to raise a child. I believe it takes a village for all of us to, ex to, to exist in that village and to exist comfortably and the way we want to exist in that village. This was a, um, a research done by the Council on Quality and Leadership um, that was posted on their website. And what it showed is that if you, and I, we don't have time to go into it, but it talks about for my community, people are better, happier, in their own home or in a family's home. That this is where they're happiest. Where their choices are met is when they're in their own home. So this is, again, some of the data that you talked about that would be very helpful for self-advocates. And then to my favorite slide, because here it talks about the things that YI has done. We have a housing assessment. As we're helping, like I said, we've been learning how to listen better. And for people moving into the community, where do they want to live? Do they want to live near to transportation? Do they want to live more in a suburban area? We're using housing assessments to help people to live where they want to live in the community. We're also teaching skills because people need independent living skills. Budgeting, cooking, cleaning, how to be safe. So, so helping people to, to um, get those skills so that they can be successful in the community. Community inclusion, so not just living in the community, but social capital. Who am I in this community? When I go to the gym and I'm not there because I'm an, I'm an active member, does someone miss me? Do they realize I haven't been there for three weeks? 
So it's for people to have um, cap social capital within their community. Teaching social roles, teaching socially acceptable skills. One of the, the issues that we find is that when people are in the community, they don't often go places because they're looked at, they stand out. So it's teaching those socially ac acceptable skills so that they do know what the socially acceptable behavior are in different locations and they can be successful. And exercise those other skills we've been teaching about how to, how to initiate a conversation, how to maintain that friendship, how to build that, that circle of supports for themselves. Travel training, we live in New York City. So that's a program that we also do in helping people to travel independently on the buses, on the train, not depending on a staff member to have to go with them, accessing Accessorite, all the services that are available. And of course, recreation services. In social inclusion, sexuality is important to us. And we realize that sexual rights are human rights. We are all sexual beings. And in helping people to understand that and helping staff to address those attitudinal barriers and recognizing that people with intellectual disabilities have the same sexual rights as everyone else, and how are we supporting them to, to fulfill that aspect of their lives. We have a program called Parents with Special Needs where we support people with disabilities in the community in helping them and teaching, teaching them about skills of how they can then raise their children. Understanding their rights. You can't advocate for what you don't understand or what you don't even know. So that is also something that we have been doing in helping people to know their rights and to understand their rights and presenting the material in visual form in ways that can be understood, so we're looking at cognitive levels and ensuring that they are understanding what those rights are, and then existing in a digital world. We live in a digital world, so teaching people how to function in that digital world is also important. And then, of course, you know, health, physical health, mental health. We have two clinics where it runs the gamut from mental health services to primary care services and ensuring that we have people, it's open to everyone, it's not just for people with disabilities, because that's another thing, that we want to ensure that people are accessing, are accessing the community, not having activities for people with disabilities, but teaching people the skills so that they can access all activities in the community just like everyone else. Thank you, Consuelo, for a brilliant overview of what it means to have person-centered supports for, for people with disabilities. Whether they're being taken out of an institution or whether they're living in the community, you've described what it takes to do a good job and be a true ally to the person. Thank you so much for that.